So the topic of today's lecture is what we call an aqueduct. Here's what I want you to do with this presentation. I want you to watch it, listen, learn something. In order to get a done stamp, you've got to show me some evidence, some proof that you watched this and that you did learn something. There's no formal set of uh, guided notes to take, but you've got to put something down in your notebook that proves to me that you watched this and you learned about aqueducts. Well, first of all, to set this up, going back to fall semester, we understand that there are certain parts of the country that get a lot of rain, and there's other places that don't get much rain at all. And consider this area down here in the southwest. It's a desert. It doesn't rain much, but a lot of people live there. Phoenix, a very large city, Southern California, lots of big cities, but not much rain. So, we get that it doesn't rain much, but there's millions of people in Phoenix. As it turns out, way up in there in the mountains of Colorado, it snows a lot up there. And when the snow melts, it runs into the Colorado River. It's a big river with lots of water in it for people. But Phoenix is over 100 miles from the Colorado River. It's not like the Chattahoochee here in Atlanta where it runs right through the middle of the city. So here we've got a bunch of water in Phoenix. The question is, where did this water come from? Now this is obviously not natural. This is a man-made transfer of water. This is not a natural water course. Remember that a water course is a place where water naturally flows, and this is quite obviously man-made. So the question becomes, where is the water coming from? The water is coming from somewhere else where it does rain a lot. And we use this device here to bring the water to Phoenix. This is the topic of today's presentation. This here is not natural. It is a man-made water course. It is called an aqueduct. And an aqueduct is a man-made river that takes water from some place where they have it to some place that doesn't. So why are these aqueducts necessary? If an area doesn't have enough water for their needs, an aqueduct will bring water to you. So that's its purpose. It brings water from somewhere where they have water to someplace where they don't. Here's some other examples of aqueducts. They're typically concrete lined, although they can just be natural because remember, these are man-made water courses. So you pour down some concrete, you make an artificial channel and you run the water through it wherever you want it to go. Sometimes they're above ground like this, other times they can be a pipe under the ground. Now here's a desert area of Southern California. And in Southern California, it doesn't rain very much, but it's really, really sunny and they have lots of nice weather year round. They have a very long growing season. What they're missing is the water. So what they've done is they build an aqueduct to bring water from the Colorado River and they use it to irrigate, irrigate all those farms in Southern California. So we get lots of fruits and vegetables from Southern California that we wouldn't be able to grow otherwise because there's not enough rainfall. Now the history of aqueducts, these are not new inventions. These were built in the Roman times. The Romans knew that the water down here in the city could get polluted very easily. Lots of sewage, lots of other contaminants. You couldn't drink the water. So the Romans would build these aqueducts where they would go way out here in the mountains, way away from people where the water was cleaner, and they would build a channel downhill and let the water flow into the city to give them good, clean, safe drinking water. A lot of the Roman aqueducts can still be found around Europe to this day. They're not used anymore to transport water, but you can see this one right here looks like a big fancy bridge, but what it is really is a channel for water on the top to flow into the city. So I'm here in Rio de Janeiro, and what you see back there behind me is an example of an aqua duct. At the top of that structure, there was a channel or a duct that transported water from way out in the country where they knew the water was clean and let it flow downhill into the city.
So let's look at California because they have a lot of problems with water in California because they got a lot of people and not much rain to give those people the water they need. Now it does rain and snow a lot in parts of California up in the mountains, but that's not where the people are. You can see from this graphic, the people are down here and the water is up here. So you can build an aqueduct that will bring that water from where they have it to where the people are and they don't have it. California has 242 miles from the Colorado River to Los Angeles. And total in the whole state, they've got 715 miles of these aqueducts to move water around where they want it to go. Therefore, California has the most extensive set of aqueducts in the modern world. And California needs this because it just doesn't rain where the people are. Now, the Colorado River has got a lot of water in it. We already said that it snows a lot up here and all summer long that water is gonna melt and makes a very big, large river with lots of water. But it doesn't go over here to San Diego or LA. So California has built these aqueducts to bring water from the Colorado River over here to the coast where the people are. The city of San Diego gets about 80 or 90% of its water transported via these aqueducts from the Colorado River and from the mountains because it is so dry in San Diego and they get almost no precipitation. They got to get that water from somewhere else. Now, before I, I, I belittle how easy this is, it's not like just, hey, let me dig a, a ditch and let the water flow downhill. There are some mountains in between the Colorado River and the Los Angeles, San Diego metropolitan area. So you just can't dig a ditch and have the water flow downhill because it won't. It's got to go up and over the mountains first. And this is what they have to do. This is what those aqueducts look like on the east side of the mountains. These are big, huge pipes, and they basically pump the water up and over the top of the mountain. Well, to do that requires a lot of infrastructure. They had to build these pipes. They have to maintain them. They have to run a pump, which takes electricity or fossil fuels to drive that water up and over the top of the mountain. Now, once it's on the other side of the mountain, then it's a pretty easy proposition. The water just starts to flow downhill. And like you see in this picture here, all the way into the cities of Los Angeles and San Diego. Now, all of this water is being moved around. And I want you to look at this picture, how big a channel this is. And this is only one of the 715 miles of aqueducts. So the amount of water that we see in here, I mean, this is about equal to the water we would have in, in the Chattahoochee River. It's, it's a lot deeper, but it's probably not as wide. So we got a lot of water that they're moving around in California. Now, unlike California, we don't have or we don't use aqueducts here in the state of Georgia to transport water. Why not? Because everybody's close to a river. The Chattahoochee River is only a few miles from us here. And even forget rivers, there are enough streams and creeks that we can get water out of that we don't have to go get water from somewhere else and transport it a long distance. Now, there's some problems. There's some really distinct disadvantages with aqueducts. They serve a great purpose. They'll bring water where you need it, but let's look at some of the problems associated with them. First of all, it's the cost. You got to build the thing and California has 750 miles of them. That's really expensive. Then you got to pay for the electricity, run the pumps. You got to pay for people to work and maintain them. This makes water in California expensive. Now, they've got no other choice. They need the water. They've got to have it. And they are willing to pay that cost. But water in California is more expensive than it is here in Georgia. So this is the best graphic that I, I could find. And it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. But we'll look at California and Long Island, New York, where you have about similar income levels. And if you look at Pebble Beach, California, their water bill here is $600 a month for a house that's $1.5 million. $600 a month is a lot. That's what uh, here you could, you could almost pay your mortgage for that. 
but you go to Long Island, a place where it rains a lot and it's fairly wet on the East Coast, and you'll notice the big difference in your water bills because water in the East is not nearly as expensive as water in the West. Little story I like to tell is I had a guy who moved into my neighborhood and he was from San Diego. I just knew him. He'd be out walking his dog. And one day I was at the mailbox. He stopped me and he talked to me. He said, hey, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. What? He's going, what's your water bill like? And I told him, you know, 40 bucks a month, whatever. Was it? And he's like, really? I was like, yeah, why? He said, well, I, I, I moved here from San Diego and I'm used to paying hundreds of dollars a month for my water bill. But here in Georgia, I was I thought it was a mistake because the water was so cheap. And that's because here water is cheaper because we don't have to move it around with these expensive aqueducts. So the first disadvantage to aqueducts is they're expensive. Now, the second problem is they upset the natural movement of water. Remember, all that water in the Colorado River was going to the ocean through the river. And if we take a bunch of water out, it changes the river, which changes the environment around the river. Now, this is what the Colorado River looks like up here before it gets to Southern California and Arizona, where people really start drawing the water out. It's a big river with lots of water moving really fast. It's kind of hard for us back east to imagine such a big, powerful river because there, it's, it, it's from so much snow melt over a very large area. It's a big river. But here's what the Colorado River looks like before it even gets to the ocean. It basically runs out of water. So much water is being taken out by LA and, and San Diego that sometimes the water in the ocean, I'm sorry, the water in the river doesn't even meet the ocean. And that's what you see here. The third problem, just like anything that's man-made, Anything that's built has a lifespan to it. These aqueducts, they wear out, they, breathe, they break, and or they leak. They have problems that you have to fix or eventually they have to be replaced. Let's look at New York City as a prime case of this. New York City, very old city, and they knew very early on that in New York City, you could not take water out of this river here. Big, huge river, the Hudson River, but it was too polluted. Too many people dump their sewage, too many factories dumping their stuff, runs right into New York City, lots of water, all too dirty. So what New York City did was they came up here in the mountains where not a lot of people lived, and they grabbed some water from there, and they ran it through pipes, generally underground, and ran it down to the city. They have a couple hundred miles, I think, worth total of aqueducts there, but they had to do it because their local water was way too dirty. This is what it looks like. This was the last major aqueduct built, and this was built between 1939 and 1945. So, you know, it's 80 years old. And you see, this is an underground tunnel, and it's 85 miles long. And you look at the size of this tunnel, yeah, you can get a lot of water going through that tunnel. And that's great because there's a lot of people in New York City who need that water. But it's 80 years old. There aren't a whole lot of man-made things that do very well after 80 plus years. And here's what's happening now. Is that aqueduct's got some cracks in it and it's leaking all over the place. Up to 35 million gallons of water per day is escaping through the aqueduct, through those little cracks. Well. The hard part is it, you just can't turn it off and, and, and fix it for a day like a plumber could. You can't turn off that much water to New York City. And it's a really big, expensive job to fix the aqueduct. This here is in a town, upstate New York, where they have apparently what looks like a bunch of springs popping up all over town, even in people's basements. And what it is, is the aqueduct running under the town is now leaking so bad that the water is popping up into this town. They've had to buy houses from people because now base, basically their house is on top of a man-made spring. This is a billion dollar project to fix and or replace these aqueducts. So once again, that's a huge downfall or downside to these. So I've got some summary questions for you here. Here's what you should have taken out of this presentation. You should know what an aqueduct is and why they are needed. 
uh, you should be very familiar that California needs aqueducts and why and why we don't need them here in Georgia. And finally, you should be able to summarize or identify the three big problems that I mentioned about using aqueducts to deliver water. 